every sale's the same, right? Well, why? Because we take control. We make it the same. We take immediate control of the sale and you have four seconds to do it. That's it. You are being judged in those first four seconds. Your prospect lays eyes on you. They see you, they rip you apart, they put you back together, they've judged each piece. And based on that, they say to themselves, either this person is number one, sharp as attack. They're sharp on the ball. Number two, they're enthusiastic. What they have must be good. They seem enthusiastic about it. And number three, most important of all, an expert in your field. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because I need them, because I wanna wake up every single day and get pushed by somebody who's doing a lot more than me, and in watching their videos, it inspires me to be bolder, to have more courage, and to go chase down the life of my dreams. And I hope it does the same for you. So today, let's learn the seven sales techniques to sell anything. Enjoy. Number one, you must be perceived as being sharp, as a tack, you're sharp, you're on the ball, you're a born problem solver. Number two, you're enthusiastic as hell. Enthusiastic as hell, meaning what you have must be good. Now I'm not talking about that bullshit over the top. Oh my God, my face up. That's, that's over the top nonsense enthusiasm. It's not what I mean. I'm talking about something called bottled enthusiasm. It could be a whisper. It's beneath the surface, but it's palpable, it's strong. And lastly, and most important of all, you are an expert in your field. Sharp as attack, enthusiastic, an expert in your field, meaning that you are someone that knows their sh You are an expert, and what do we do when we're in the position or in the presence of experts? What do we do? We defer. We've been trained since we're yay big to defer to experts. When we were very young, our parents took us to the doctor when we were sick, right? And even our own parents would defer. We're like, wow, this is a very special guy. He's been to school. The doctor would ask us questions. We would answer. We don't interrupt them. When we are in presence of experts, we defer. You must be perceived as sharp as a tack enthusiastic as hell, an expert in your field. If you're not perceived this way, what happens? The prospect tries to take control. When we believe that we're dealing with a novice, someone who's dull, not enthusiastic, we will take control. And what I realized that first night I invented the straight line back in 1988, believe it or not, this is what I realized. I had a certain way of talking, a certain way of acting that commanded authority. People knew they were in the presence of an expert. And because of that, they would defer to me I was able to take control of the conversation. And once I had control, I could then make every sale decision. I could follow a certain roadmap to closing everyone using the same technique. If the prospect is in control, how could you do that? You can't use any technique because you're, you're, you don't know what's coming next. The first step in what's called the straight line syntax, is you must take immediate control of the sale. You must take control, because what's really happening in the mind of the prospect, and it happens in those first four seconds, they say, this is a person worth listening to. That's what this chunks up and say, you know what? He's sharp, enthusiastic, she's sharp, enthusiastic, expert. They are worth listening to because he or she can help me achieve my goals. They can help me get what I want. That's why people listen to you. We seek out experts to solve our problems, eliminate our pain. You must be perceived this way. When you are, what happens? They defer, so watch. Number one, you got four seconds. You, sound, you must sound this way. This is how you must be perceived. The prospect says, wow, this person's an expert in their field, they're sharp, wow. I'm gonna defer, they probably can help me get what I want. They're experts, I've been taught that it's respectful to defer to an expert. So now that gives you the opportunity to take control. You then take control and you use that 
to start asking questions. And he would ask those questions in a very specific way using certain tonalities and you start building massive rapport that way. Technique number two is give value with Grant Cardone. You've sold billions of dollars in revenue throughout your career. Yep. You know, how have you been able to consistently close massive deals? What is Grant Cardone's secret to sales? 80% of everything we do here is free. Now the 20% that pay me, you know, this year will pay me $150 million. But the 80% got, got a billion dollars worth of advice. They just didn't pay me anything, but they came into my funnel. Right, they came into my, okay, now I know who they are. Can I serve them when they're ready to pay something? Not everybody's ready to pay, right? So like when I was a kid, man, I, I wouldn't pay for anything. Because they didn't have any money. So if, if I went, if, you know, if you walk into a casino in Vegas, you can walk in. You don't have to have money. All you got to do is walk in. Everything's free. So in my world, I'm a big open casino. Like everything's free. Now, when you get in, you're like, you know, I'd like to sit at that table with the whales. Well, then that costs something. Or I want to sit over this table with the $100 players. Or I want to go over here and play this game. Well, to do that, then you got to sit down and you got to pay. So we've raised $1.1 billion crowdfunding on the Internet. I don't go to wealthy people. I don't go to Mark Cuban and say, hey, fund my project. I've never gone to a big um, equity fund like a Blackstone and say, give me a billion dollars. I could, but I don't. I go to I build a big audience. I create great products and offers, and then I go to that audience and say, would you guys like to invest with me? So out of, we, I think we have 450,000 people in an investor uh, that raised their hand and said, I'm interested in your investments. 13,000 of the 400,000 invested with me. You need to change your mind about closing people. Closing people is when you service them for the first time. You guys need to understand that when you close a deal, when somebody actually buys your product, service, or offer, whatever your offer is, that's when you finally service them. I don't think about the clothes being, I got you, I got you, uh, you know, I don't think about it being that. And I think a lot of salespeople think, oh, I got you, you know, no, I didn't get you, dude. I, f I finally, I finally serviced you when I closed you. And by the way, that should be the first close. That should be of the 154,000 people that bought something from me last year, 45,000 of them have bought three, four, five, six, seven, eight things, like 30% of our and, and I want to get the other 70% to make sure that's not the first thing and the only thing they buy from me. Technique number three is build trust with Vusi Tembequeo. How do you sell anything to anyone? For those of you watching this wondering why you care, because life is sales. You sell yourself to your partner. You sell yourself to your children. You sell yourself at your job. You sell yourself to your boss. You sell yourself to your clients. All of us are constantly selling, especially those of you that think you're not. And there's one way to sell anything to anybody. It's the oldest trick in the book. And it's not a trick. It's a way of living your life. Build trust. How do you build trust? Commit to something, deliver on it, communicate effectively, and make sure that everything you say you're going to do, you do. And if you can't, that you communicate up front. This is an age-old wisdom. It's probably not going to trend this video. You're not going to share it a million times with your friends because it sounds common sense. You know, the crazy thing about living in the world in 2023 is the common things are just not so common anymore. You want to stand out? build trust, do the simple things really, really well. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Technique number four is believe in what you're selling with Gary V. Listen, at the end of the day, vanity metrics, whether that's followers on Instagram, whether that's the jewelry or car you drive, no matter what it is, at the end of the day, underneath all of that, there needs to be something tangible and real. And if you're not asking for business, and more importantly, if you're not selling something you believe in, you're finished. The single reason I think I'm a great salesman as somebody who hates to ask for a sale is because I deeply believe in what I'm selling. Whether it's the wine I produce, whether it's a sneaker collaboration I have with K-Swiss, whether it's Vayner, I, I sit in this, do you know what it feels like to sit in this room and know, think, 
know that VaynerMedia is the best marketing firm in the world, it's, it's empowering. You, you sell with conviction. And I, I just watch way too many people uh, either be deeply insecure about what they're selling because deep down they know they have no idea what the f- they're selling. I say they don't know what selling. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Or they're just broken. They just so care about money. They know exactly what they're selling. They just know they're selling bullshit and they're f- preying on people's fears. And I want to kill those. F- Technique number five is aim to help with Mark Cuban. If you come up with an idea where you say I can make dollar bills for fifty cents. Would you go out and raise money or would you just go out and sell it? You just go out and do it, you know, and and that's what you have to do. And look, we all go through that fear factor of, do I quit my job? Do I, can I do this? Um, Can I, can I do this and what happens next? The one thing I I know with 100% certainty and what I would tell myself is, if I can sell and become a better and better salesperson and be great at selling, I'm always gonna be successful whether I'm working for myself or if the company that I started just didn't work. I'll I'll give you an example. Um, Out of Indiana, um, before I I went down to Dallas, I I needed to start something. And um, I decided that everybody drank milk and I found this product, powdered milk, that was cheaper and everybody needed to save money. And I was going to go out there and sell it because it was cheaper. Now, it didn't taste quite as good. <laughs> and so what I've, but I went out there to try to sell it. Failed miserably. But I learned how to make the sales effort even when things weren't going right. I learned that the rejection was, every no got me closer to a yes. That not every product was perfect, but I could take those same skills, even in failure, and translate them so that what I learned selling garbage bags door to door, what I learned from selling powdered milk that was awful, what I learned from selling local area networks at Micro Solutions, all those things accumulated and I, I got better at selling. So I always knew, you know, people always say to me, if you lost everything, what would you do? I can sell. I can sell, and it's not about selling ice to Eskimos. It's not about you know, convincing people to do this. Selling is always about helping. Selling is always about understanding the person you're talking to and what their needs are. And if someone can help me make my life easier, yeah. People, you know, now with employees, people always say, well, like, what's the definition of a great employee? Someone who can reduce the stress of those around them. And it's the same thing. What's the definition of a great salesperson? Someone who can reduce the stress of their salespeople. And if in looking at your company and looking at your your life and looking at your goals, if you're able to go out there and recognize that whether it works or doesn't work, you're putting yourself in a position where you're helping somebody, not convincing somebody, but and you're reducing their stress, you're gonna you're gonna be okay. It's going to work out, and you know that's the confidence I, I've, I've built in myself that wasn't necessarily always there. Um, but I learned that if I try to help, if I reduce people's stress, good things can happen. Technique number six is be honest with Layla Hermosi. When you're first starting off in business, you don't need to think sales like, am I building a giant sales department, a sales org? You just need to figure out, can you sell? (laughs) Because in the beginning, the best salesperson is actually the founder. In the beginning of every business that Alex and I started, we were the first salespeople. And at Appenstitch.com, that means we were the first ones that were closing the first deals. It is one of the most paramount pieces of the business because it is the bridge between the marketing and the back end. You learn so much about the customer through doing sales that I think you would be doing yourself a disservice in the beginning by not doing this starting out. The more people that you talk to and have sales conversations with, the more people that you understand who is a fit for my product or service and who isn't. Because a lot of the times people think, oh, I just can't sell. But it might actually be that you're trying to sell to the wrong people. It was the first skill that I understood personally in our businesses and because of it I was able to learn so many other skills because I had that foundation. I think that the best way to get better at sales when you're first starting off is to stop labeling it as sales. I didn't read a ton of books on sales and I didn't know a lot about sales before I started doing sales. I was told that I was just signing somebody up for a gym. 
through that process of signing somebody up, I think it relieved a lot of pressure. It's not convincing people, it's not coercing people, it's just showing them, you want this, I have this, we are matched. The best way to sell is just be honest with people, to tell the truth, and state the facts about what you provide, about what you do, and about who's best for your product or service. And technique number seven, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is Shift Your Thinking with Robert Kiyosaki. I mean, so many people say, well, I can't afford this, I can't afford that, I can't afford to buy real estate, I can't afford to buy Bitcoin, I can't afford to buy... Well, the reason you can't afford to buy something is because you can't sell. And sales equals income. So back in 1974, you know, my, my dad wanted me to go to the University of Hawaii and get my PhD. And I said, no, I'm going to, or he wanted to fly for the airlines because I was a pilot. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to learn how to sell. And it was, he was, up my, he was upset. He said, you know, salesmen are, salesmen are crooks, they're con artists. You know, it's not, it's not a very honorable profession. But that's why he was poor. You know, so many PhD types, academic types, they think they're above the capitalist process. They think their PhD entitles them to the better life. But if you go for your PhD, you really don't have the skill sets to be in the capitalist world. You know, like when my, my father, you know, bless his heart, he ran for lieutenant governor against his boss, the governor. As a Republican in the People's Republic of Hawaii, you know, Hawaii is 100% communist. And um, so he ran as a Republican and he lost. And the governor said to him, you'll never work in this state again. So the power the governor had over my dad was his job. And the hardest thing for a school teacher, Patrick, is you, as a capitalist, you really don't need a school teacher. You need a salesman. And my father just couldn't sell. He wouldn't, you know, he, he just kept holding up his PhD. I have mm. a PhD, but he couldn't sell. Wow. And you know what I mean? And, and I saw that. And that's when my uh, rich dad, who had no education at all, said, um, you better learn how to sell pretty quickly. Making a product that people love starts with you making something that you love. Really, think about it. Would you buy from you? Would you subscribe to you? Would you comment and tell your friends about you? In our rush to get rich, to make money, we push products out that we don't love. And if you don't love them, people around you won't love them either. So look at my YouTube channel as an example. I love my YouTube channel. I make my YouTube channel for myself. I learn, it's selfish, it's for me. The top 10 rules videos, the espresso videos, the content that I bring together, I need it. It's my education. I love my channel. I would share my channel with other people. If I saw my channel and I wasn't creating, it'd be the first thing that I subscribe to. It would be much watch YouTube for me. I need it. And if you guys didn't like it, I would still create it for myself. It wouldn't have as much editing and fancy effects and all that stuff, but I would still do it because I need it for me. I make it for myself selfishly and then I share it with you guys and thankfully you guys like it enough that I can turn a business from it and continue to hire a team and create more content and pump more stuff out but as much as I think that my channel still needs to get better and grow and improve and I still suck and I need to continuously get better at the, at the work that I do I think my channel deserves a Nobel Peace Prize like I think my channel is amazing and you have to love what you do. You have to feel like the thing that you're doing, yes, can always get better, but it's really solving a problem. Your product, your service, what you create, your expertise solves a problem. You know that it's genuinely helping people. If you don't have that belief, you're never gonna win. This is why so many people who are starting businesses, when you go and you look at hot business trends for 2019 or 2020 or how to win in network marketing and like what products I should sell. If that's how you're starting, you're gonna lose. If you're just chasing trends, you will lose. There's nothing wrong with network marketing per se. Just most of the people getting into it are just trying to make a buck. Just like how most people get into entrepreneurship. You're just trying to make money, too many people. And then you end up going broke because the people who love doing that thing will crush you every day of the week. Think about who you're going up against. You're going up against people in whatever industry you're in. You're going up against people 
who have experience, who have expertise, who have knowledge and love the thing that they're doing, and you're going to go in because it's a hot trend for this year and expect to win? No. Now, if you love it and you absorb it and it's, it's for you and it's must have, you will pour so much energy, so much love, so much creativity and find a path that nobody else has seen before. That's how you ultimately win. That's how you can then start talking about it, start promoting it, start building exposure, getting word of mouth. If you want people to talk about you, you have to create something that is worth talking about. And there's no way that you create it unless you absolutely love the thing that you're doing. So you have to create a product or service that you would use yourself. You have to create a channel that you would subscribe to yourself. You have to feel confident that if your mom was suffering with a problem that your business could solve, that you would recommend it 100% to your mom. If my mom was struggling with entrepreneurship, you need to subscribe to my channel. It will help you. It will save you. If you can't be like that yet, go back, make it better until you find something that you absolutely love and pour your energy into. So I'm gonna give you a three-step process that you can follow to help you evaluate where you're at and how you can get better. Step number one, get out of your space. Wherever you're at right now, wherever you're working, you're in front of your computer, you're at your office, you're at your home, your basement, whatever, wherever you normally work, wherever you are right now, get out of your space. Just get out of your typical space. Go outside for a walk, go down to the lobby, cross the street, whatever. Get outside your typical space. Okay. Step number two, now that you're in a different space, think about your customers. Think about who you are helping. Think about the problem that you solve. So if it's me, I can go for a walk outside. I'm thinking about entrepreneur. I'm getting out of my space. It's too easy to get locked into what, we're, what I'm doing, right? I got to make, I got to make 20 videos today. I got to respond to comments. I got to connect with my team. I got to all the stuff adds up and we forget about our customers. So I go outside and think about entrepreneurs. And I try to picture the people that I've helped, the people who've come to my workshops, the people who ask me questions, the people who join me on lives, right? Close your eyes, you're in a new space now, and you think about your customers. Think about the people who you help, the people that you are designing your products and services for. Think about them, picture them. Try to picture somebody, right? Picture an individual that you know that you are trying to help. Picture that person in your mind. And if you don't have a customer yet, think about the ideal customers that you're trying to target and try to come up with a face, somebody that you can look at. And in step number three, go back to where you were, go back to your office, your computer, wherever you were with that person in mind and then evaluate your products. With that person in mind, look at your YouTube videos, look at your products, look at your services, look at your Instagram feed, whatever you're trying to get out there, look at your books, look at your books, whatever you're trying to promote, look at them with that person in mind now. You've stepped outside your day to day. You're above, you're not in the, in the muck of doing all the work. I know you've got tons of stuff to do. You're an entrepreneur, I feel you. You've stepped outside, you've imagined that person, you're coming back and looking at your products or services with fresh eyes, with them in mind. Do they actually need it? Will this change their life? Will this solve their problems? And if not, go make it better. When it comes to an affirmation, uh, affirmations can be powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and for some people, they're not. And a lot of people say, well, you know, if, the, if the, the affirmation is so powerful, how come I'm not experiencing the effect? Mm -hmm. the, what scientists tell us is the average human speaks to themselves consciously or unconsciously. We have thoughts spinning around in our brain about 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day. Some of those thoughts are the words to the songs and they are the affirmations. Uh, neuroscientist Andrew Newberg tells us, Newberg is his name, I'm sorry, in, um, in his work that, that a single word, a single word has the power to, to change the genes that create stress or relieve stress in our lives. He's telling us that, that something within us has the ability to shift to the very core of, of our expression. So we know that words are, are powerful. The key to a successful affirmation is that we must communicate with the subconscious part of our, of our mind, number one. Number two, we must communicate in the language that the subconscious recognizes. And this is where, uh, you know, you can say, I, I had a friend of mine when I was working in the corporations that had affirmations all over his office, all over his computer screen. They were on little post-it notes in the car we would carpool in. You know, my perfect mate is manifesting for me now. My perfect mate is manifesting for me now. That was his affirmation. 
And I said, do you say these things? He goes, oh man, I say them about a million times a day. I said, do they work for you? He says, nah. <laughs> you know, these, these things don't work. And I said, well, why do you think they don't work? And he said, look at me. He says, I'm an engineer, I'm a slob. He said, I, I wear the same clothes to work three out of five days during the week, you know? And, and it, the, the bottom line, by the time he finished describing himself to me, even he didn't believe that he was worthy of his perfect mate manifesting for him now. So he was saying the words, but he was not, there was the, the uh, underlying emotion and what he was actually feeding into his, his system was counter to what those words were saying. So it's, it's not enough to say the words. When we go into our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions, those words are what become the prayers. And for many people, I have, and I know you've heard this as well, a lot of people feel that prayer is broken, that the world doesn't work today the way it worked in biblical times, that we have lost our power and that we have no ability to communicate with uh, a greater power, with God, with the, the forces around us. Uh, and it's largely because the secrets, the deep truth of our relationship, the fundamental physics of our relationship to our world uh, have been minced and parceled and in many cases deleted from the texts, leaving us with a, a sense that we are essentially powerless beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you are powerless, then you are a victim. And if you're a victim, you need a savior. And that savior is coming to us on a silver plate in terms of technology, in terms of political leaders. I will save you if you just do these things. And this is why I say, I think one of the most, the most powerful acts and the most radical act we can do is to think for ourselves uh, original thinking based upon the deep truth of our relationship to our bodies in the earth, not based upon the false assumptions of obsolete science that permeate our academic world right now. It's one of the reasons I left academia. It's one of the reasons many of my colleagues who are in this genre, who are very well-respected scientists, have left academia because they were not allowed to share with students and in their writings and their papers, what they had found in their research that reflects a, a very different reality. Now, for me, it's, it's, a, uh, it's good news. It's a beautiful message of hope and possibility uh, as a sovereign biological being. For a system that's based on centralized power and control, it's probably the worst news they, <laughs> they could imagine because it means we don't need the centralized power and control. I, I think ultimately we're all better off by embracing our own power uh, because it frees us from the fear of a changing world. And we all know our world, my world is changing, your world is changing, uh, boy is it ever, <laughs> yeah. faster than we can document it in, in our classrooms and textbooks. But the change isn't necessarily bad uh, until we compare it to what we've known in the past and this is where the fear comes in. So the, the new discoveries helping us to understand we are part of rather than separate from our world. And this is, this is where the affirmations come in. So in, um, I was at the CERN Superconducting Super Collider in Geneva, Switzerland, where the, the physics experiments that are revealing what happened moments after our universe began. They recreate the, the beginning of our universe, and then they're able to document what happened then to create the laws of physics that we are experiencing, that we're living under right now. And what they announced in 2012 is that there is in fact a field, an intelligent field of energy, it's a subtle energy that underlies all of creation. Um, before then, it was a metaphor, or a lot of people felt like it was a new age concept. You know, we are all one, everything mm -hmm. is, is connected. Or an indigenous, you know, a lot of indigenous elders talk about this. But here's, here's where they got stuck. And I've gone to scientific conferences where they'll, they'll take their hands and they'll say, oh yeah, there's, that's, that's no longer controversial. There is a field, there's a field out there that connects all things, and their hands go like this. Mm. There's a field out there that connects all things, because subconsciously they're still saying we're separate from that field. Right. But here's what the science is showing us, and this, this was a game changer for me, uh, just a mind blower, that every atom 
in every molecule and every cell of our bodies in this very instant. So it's not like it's about to happen, it's, it's happening right now. Every atom is constantly emerging and collapsing into that field. And what that says to us is that we are the field. It's not the fields out there. We literally are wrinkles, we are disturbances in this field, this, this body that is held in place by a conscious awareness as long as I'm breathing on this earth. Uh, I am a disturbance, I'm a, I'm a localized wrinkle in that field and what that means is that if I wanna bring about change in my world, I don't have to force a change out there, I become that change. Mm -hmm. And as I have become that change, the field is now reflecting what it is because I'm part of the field. Mm -hmm. So it's a subtle, but it's a very powerful way, very different way of thinking. You're not, you're not imposing change on the world around you. You are becoming the change. So you're becoming the abundance. You're becoming uh, the love, the gratitude, the care, uh, the healing. You're becoming those things, and that is very different. We're conditioned to ask for them, mm -hmm. to plead for them, because we're led to feel powerless in our lives when in fact there are modalities of ancient prayer that were edited from the, the religious texts in the fourth century by the church. They took, they took out the information helping us to understand that this, this deep relationship, leaving us powerless. And, and affirmations are essentially a, a, a form of prayer or prayer is a form of affirmation, however you, you want to look at it, where we are communicating. And I want to be really clear, it's not about control, it's not about manipulation, it's not about imposing our will, it's about participating in the way that this field unfolds and expresses in, in our lives. And when you really begin to get that shift, it's, it's subtle and it's powerful, it's not making something happen out there. Mm -hmm. And that means you can't blame what's out there for your experiences. I, I come from a very dysfunctional, broken family, and I had to make a choice early in life as to whether or not I would, and, and community, uh, as to whether or not I would allow that to define my, my experience, to define my existence. Uh, other people around me had the same experience, and they made very different choices. They, uh, today, continue to blame uh, their environment, their parents, their family, their upbringing for the sad and unfortunate things in their lives. And, and that's a path. Mm -hmm. It's not right, wrong, good or bad. But we have a choice to make another path. And when we began as a scientist, beginning to understand these relationships gave me the reason to think differently. Uh, and it also gave me the reason to test in my life if those thoughts are really true or not, what works and what doesn't. I know you all have big goals, big dreams, big aspirations, just like I do. You've got ambitions to become an amazing person, to build your career, to create, to contribute, to give, to be an awesome human being. But all of that is impossible without great habits set up. If you don't have routine and structure set up in a way that will keep you on track, then you'll, you'll fall off. And, and, and having new goals without new habits is kind of like you know, having a new car without wheels. You know, the, the habits are the wheels. They're the things that make you able to achieve the goals. So you gotta have good habits. But the challenge for most people isn't that knowledge. I mean, you know you need to have good habits. It's, you can't keep the habit going, right? Have you ever started at the new year, you're gonna get healthier, and you start that habit of working out more on a more regular basis, and then it goes away? Or you say, you know what, I'm gonna be more kind and more patient and more awesome to my partner, my lover, and you start being nice for two or three days and then on the fourth day, you're a jerk, you know? And you're like, what, what happened? I, I said I was gonna be nicer. It's that you didn't set up the most important thing you needed to maintain a habit. So what's the biggest secret I've learned in almost 20 years in this field? It's so simple, but most people don't have it. It's called trigger moments. You have to set up trigger moments to activate your habits. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say you want to become a, a better person. You know, you wanna become more kind, more patient, more loving with people. Now, you can just set that intention or write that down in your vision, or in your, your journal, or set up on a vision board that you look at once in a while, but in day-to-day -day life, it's not enough. You need things to trigger you, to remind you 
to be that particular kind of person, right? It's almost like if you could have a little angel speaking in your ear all day long to tell you what to do and how to be, you would obviously become better. Well, that makes sense. Well, let's use that idea. Let's use that idea by setting up alarms on our phones that trigger us to do the very things we need to do. This is gonna be so basic, you're gonna laugh, and then I'll also tell you how I've literally taught this to Fortune 50 CEOs, and they said it was the one thing that changed their life the most dramatically. So let's start with this, let's have a goal in mind. Let's say you want to become more present and calm throughout the day. Again, you could write that down on a journal. I'm gonna be more present and calm. You could meditate in the morning saying, today I'm gonna be more present and calm. And you could, you, could, you could start out with good intentions, but those fall apart without a trigger moment set up throughout the day to remind you that. So what if you did this? What if you just set up on your phone three alarms during the day with a label that said, close your eyes, take 10 deep breaths in, remind yourself to be calm. So let's say you're going through your day, it's crazy, right? It's 10 a.m. and all of a sudden, bing, your phone goes off, you look down and it says, close your eyes, take 10 deep breaths. And then again, it happens at two o'clock. And again, it happens at 6 p.m. And again, it happens at 8 p.m. What's gonna happen? You always look at your phone, don't you? It's gonna go throughout the day, you're gonna forget. And the funniest thing is, I've had so many people do this worldwide. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people I've taught to do this, hundreds of thousands. And they tell me all the time, that, that changed everything. And you'll think, once you set it up, that the next day you, you'll, you'll forget about it. No, that alarm will go off. You forgot you set the dang alarm. There it goes off in your face. And you're like, all right, I'm trying to be calmer and more present. Close my eyes, take 10 deep breaths, reground myself, here we go. It, you can't do it once a day. You have to have moments throughout the day that trigger you to enact the new behavior. I know this makes sense to you, but it's a challenge for a lot of people because they never set those things up. So what if you did it with an alarm? So for example, for me on the opposite spectrum, I don't want to just be calmer and more present. I want more energy throughout the day. So here's what I do. One of my big trigger moments is every time my butt hits a chair, I don't care if I'm on a plane or I was like where we're shooting here, I, I wrote a lot of my books here. I wrote the Motivation Manifesto here. I wrote The Charge here. And if I'm going to write, my butt hits the chair, I grab my phone, I open the timer, and I set 50 minutes. Now at 50 minutes, the timer goes, bzzz, it starts buzzing, and I look at that and I go, oh, that's my trigger to get energy. So I stand up, I go get some water, I take a glass of water, drink it down, I do some stretches, and I do some exercise just really briefly, or I'll go for a walk, whatever it is, but I'll do something that usually takes just two to five minutes. Then I'll sit back down, I'll set that 50 minute alarm and I'll work. And what that does is every 50 minutes, it triggers me to change how I'm physically moving. It changes my attention so that throughout the day, I'm continually refreshed. So I never have that two, three, four o'clock time where I'm like, ah, you know, why? Because I've triggered my day so much that my energy is maintained throughout the day. Makes sense, right? This could be as simple as, let's say you wanna be healthier in your life. Okay, let's set up some trigger moments for you in this way. Let's say every time you drop off the kids, on the way back to the house, you stop at the grocery store and get some fresh produce. That's just a trigger. It's like, okay, did one thing, drop kids off. Now, tied to that, triggered from that action, drop kids off is go to health food store. Or let's say you wanna get healthier in the morning. One of the easiest ways to help people maintain a better exercise program is this. Set a trigger, you wake up in the morning, your first action is to drink water, put your exercise shoes on, uh, you might get dressed if you were naked, just saying. So you get dressed, put your shoes on, you go downstairs or you go to the gym and that's the trigger. You woke up, you do these actions. Nothing interrupts those actions, that's the action. And you have to have those set up. One of my other favorite trigger moments to set up is door frame triggers. What do you mean by that? When you walk into a new room, to have a psychological trigger go off in your mind that you've associated with that door frame. So let me give you an example. If I walk into my house at night, if I've been working all day and I'm gonna walk in, I'm gonna see my lady, I have it so when I ever walk through the doors of my house, three words repeat off immediately in my mind because I've done it so many times consciously. 
I went to the door, I said the three words, said the three words, said the three words, and I did this so many times that now, when I walk through a door, my mind automatically triggers those three words, and I remember to be those three words. So what words would you love to have describe you as a person, that you would be happy if that was how people described you? What would those words be? Have those and now set them up in your life. I teach executives to do this as well. I have them have a door frame trigger when they walk into their office in the morning. As soon as they walk through that door frame, they have, boom, three words go through their mind about how they want to be perceived as a leader. I have them set up another door frame. Every time they walk into a meeting, into the conference room, when they walk through the doors of the conference room, they have another three words that trigger off for them. And it just reminds them how to be. So these aren't big, crazy things. A lot of people they think they have to completely change their life. What would change your life completely is setting up more trigger moments and associations that when you see something, you do this. That when this action is taken, then that happens. That when you uh, have the opportunity to set up alarms on your phone, you set them up. So that you're interrupted in your everyday life to remind yourself to stick to the habits, to stick to the intention. You do that enough on a continual basis, you'll find yourself in so many ways completely rejuvenated, and I promise you'll stick to your habits even more. And once you do that, you know that everything changes. One of the things that will help you to do the work to create the things that you want in your life is it will help you if you train your mind to start spotting evidence as you're doing the work, as you're going through your day, it will help you if you train your mind to start scanning the world and spotting evidence that yes, indeed, <clears throat> the world is sending you positive signals that things are going to work out. Now, why is it important to train your mind to help you get what you want? Well, the reason why is because if you get into a negative mindset, if you start thinking, this business is never going to work. Why even bother? Or, I'm never going to meet anybody. It's nothing but losers out there. Look at all these idiots on Hinge. Why the hell should I keep doing this? If you allow your mind to start to rest in a pessimistic, negative, protective, scared, and doubtful stance, your mind will continue to show you reasons why there's nobody on Hinge worth talking to. Your mind will continue to show you all the reasons why you will never make it in business. Your mind will continue to show you all the reasons why you're never going to lose that weight and be able to tuck in your shirt, as my friend Corinne Crabtree always talks about, that transformational moment. And when your mind goes negative, your mind starts to scan the world and will show you more reasons to stop. And the power of training your mind to spot positive signs is very simple. The power is that your mind will start to show you reasons to keep going. Your mind will help you take the step. Your mind will encourage you to feel optimistic, to feel empowered. Just like you woke up today on a Tuesday and it was February 22nd. 2022 and those numbers are lining up and that makes you in your heart and soul go whoa something cool could happen today like that shit only happens like once in my lifetime those numbers are going to line up like that today is a really cool day let's go do something with this you could create that kind of attitude every single freaking day of your life you could if you train your mind and if you start taking action and training your mind is the key piece that we're going to talk about so for those of you that have read the high five habit one of the things that i talk about a lot is every single day find a naturally occurring heart-shaped object in the world it could be a stone it could be a leaf it could be a cloud it could be a shape in your coffee hey chris if we've got anything around here that looks like a heart hand it to me and the reason why i love telling you to start playing a game with yourself where you start your day going mind brain show me some heart oh what is this come here Dog treat. Oh my God, it's a dog treat. Look at this, guys. <laughs> what shape is that? That right there is a heart. There we go. Check that out. If you say, brain, mind, show me a heart today, guess what's going to happen? That damn dog biscuit 
it's going to show it's going to you're going to be like there's a heart you're going to look out at the sky and you're going to see a heart shape oh right there in the mountains there's a heart shape in the mountains in southern vermont you're going to see it in the clouds what you're doing when you tell your mind what's important to you is you're telling your mind and the filter in your brain to change in real time and allow into your consciousness what's important to you and if you want to see hearts by god those damn dog treats are going to start looking like hearts everybody that's how you train your mind it's freaking incredible and if you want to see evidence of this follow me on social media if you follow me mel robbins on social media you will see every day i am reposting your stories of finding heart shapes around the world now why is this important well it's important because it's a simple way to prove to you that your mind changes in real time that if you get serious about becoming more positive and optimistic and encouraging of yourself, if you get serious about saying this, I don't want to see all the reasons why I'm unhappy. I don't want to see uh, everybody else in the world that's launched a business or that's lost weight and is healthy or that has a really good uh, marriage or relationship. And I don't want to see that and 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 have my mind process it as evidence that it's never going to happen for me i want my mind to reprogram itself and see other people's businesses and see other people getting healthy and see other people in relationships and i want my mind to say yeah if they can do it i can do it that's evidence if that person can get healthy so can i if that person can find somebody on hinge so can i if that person can reconcile with their child so can i other people can become evidence that you can have it too right now your mind is so f***ed up from your past that when you see what other people have and you don't have it you can't actually translate it through a negative mind and and see that that's evidence that you're going to win you see it like oh somebody already stole what i wanted that sucks and so what i want to start to open your mind to is that you have the power to train your mind to filter the world differently just like you woke up and you saw the date today 2 22 22 and your brain saw that and was like whoa this is a once in a lifetime day everybody you are never going to have another day that lines up like this, ever. What are you going to do with this day? Your mind already interpreted this as, wow, something cool could happen. And if you tell yourself something amazing is going to happen today, something will, because you're going to be looking for it. I swear to God, something will. Something will. If you want to see the good all around you, you got to tell your mind, you want to see the good. And this just isn't a bunch of horse shit, everybody. This isn't toxic positivity. There is a filter in your brain called the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system. I call it the RAS. I like to think about it like a giant hairnet on your head. And this RAS sits over your brain. I'm probably getting this wrong. I'm not a neuroscientist. I could give a shit about getting it right. I just need you to know the basics here so that you can apply it to your life, okay? You don't need a PhD to use the science that super smart people have been working really hard on in order to apply it to your life. That's what I'm here for in your life. I'm here to translate this stuff into simple, believable, and actionable things that you can do to take all this super cool stuff that people are researching and apply it to your normal person's everyday life to help you change from the inside out. And one of the coolest things that you have at your disposal is you have a whole system in your body that you can train and change. And one of those things that you can train and change that is impacted by that real, that word you're hearing a lot of, neuroplasticity, that just means that things are able to twist and bend and change and you're able to learn new things for as long as you're alive. As long as you're breathing, everybody, you got a chance to change the way that you think. As long as you are breathing, you got a chance to change from the inside out how you experience your life. As long as you are still here watching me, people, you got a chance to create a new experience in your life. And one of the things that helps a lot is understanding that right now, all of the bullshit from your past has jammed the filter in your mind, body, and spirit, the reticular activating system. And it is clouding your ability 
to look at the world around you and see hearts. Remember this? Dog treat. Hearts. Look at that. There's a heart right there. I talked to so many smart, fantastic, ambitious, idealistic, hardworking kids. And they're right out of college. They're in their entry-level jobs. And I'll ask them, how's it going? And they'll say, I think I'm going to quit. And I'm like, why? They say to me, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you know you've been here eight months, right? <laughs> they treat the sense of fulfillment or even love like it's a scavenger hunt, like it's something you look for. My millennial friends, they've gone through so many jobs. They're either getting fired, I mean it was mutual, <laughs> or they're quitting because they're not making an impact or they're not finding the thing they're looking for, or they're not feeling fulfilled, as if it's a scavenger hunt. Love, a job you find joy from, is not something you discover. It's not like, I found love. Here it is. I found a job I love. That's not how it works. Both of those things require hard work. You are in love because you work very hard every single day of your life to stay in love. You find a job that brings you ultimate joy because you work hard every single day to serve those around you and you maintain that joy. It's not a discovery. But the problem is the sense of impatience. It's as if an entire generation is standing at the foot of a mountain. They know exactly what they want. They can see the summit. What they can't see is the mountain. This large, immovable object. That doesn't mean you have to do your time. That's not what I'm talking about. Take a helicopter, climb, I don't care. But there's still a mountain. Life, career fulfillment, relationships are journeys. The problem is this entire generation has an institutionalized sense of impatience. And do they have the patience to go on the journey to maintain love, to feel fulfilled? Or do they just quit and on to the next? Dump and on to the next? Ghost and on to the next? And by the way, ghosting means the lack of skill to have a confrontation. You date somebody for six months, eight months, and then just stop replying. You just delete them from everything. <laughs> now, for the person who's doing the ghosting, oh, that's certainly easier than a confrontation. But the person on the receiving end of the ghosting, it's like there's a death. They're suddenly shunned. There's panic. They call out, they're worried. They call out, they're worried. They think it's you, they think it's them. Do you have any idea the destruction that we reap on people by ghosting them? And then because there's the lack of social skills to call out and ask for help, they internalize and it makes them feel awful to the point. At the worst, they will kill themselves. Slightly one level down, they'll get depressed. But the lowest level that we can hope for is they will go through life, and I'm not talking about ghosting, I'm talking an entire generation, that if we don't fix this, we'll go through life where everything's just fine. My friendships are fine, my work is fine. You know, same old, same old. Nothing's ever amazing. And the scavenger hunt continues. And then you go to the fourth observation, the most egregious of all of them, environment. We're taking a generation that has lower self-esteem. We're taking a generation that has a lack of coping mechanisms to deal with stress. We're dealing with a generation that wants all those things fixed immediately. And we're placing them in work environments that values money more than people. Do you know that most of the business philosophies, most of the business theories that we embrace and see as standard today are not standard. They're theories left over from the 80s and 90s. The concept of shareholder supremacy was a theory proposed in the late 1970s. It was popularized in the 80s and 90s. The concept of using mass layoffs to balance the books did not exist in the United States prior to the 1980s. It did not exist. It became popular in the 80s and 90s. The 80s and 90s were boom years. Anyone could make money. Relative peace, a kinder, gentler, cold war. And so all of the business theories that were put forth were very, very selfish and all about enriching ourselves. And they worked for those times. But these times are different. These are not peaceful times. These are not boom years. This is, there's globalization and the internet which has now made everything vastly more complicated and those theories do not work anymore. Worse, they're having side effects. It's really bad. 
Because what we do is we destroy corporate cultures. The idea of using mass layoffs, can you imagine sending someone home and saying, I'm sorry, I can no longer provide for our family because the company missed its arbitrary projections this year. That's what we're doing. That's like a, a coach prioritizing the needs of the fans over the needs of the players, hoping to build a great team. It doesn't work. We dismantled things like the Glass-Steagall Act. Glass-Steagall was passed after the Great Depression to prevent another Great Depression from happening. It was dismantled in the 80s and the 90s in the name of profit. Okay? Do you know how many stock market crashes we had between the Great Depression and the dismantling of Glass-Steagall? The answer is zero. And since they dismantled Glass-Steagall, we had 87, the dot-com crash, 2008. We've had three stock market crashes because we've moved the safety mechanisms that prevent stock market crashes from happening, all in the name of individual advancement and profit. And these are the corporate cultures we've built. Corporate cultures that value numbers over people. And they are not standard business practices. They are new, and they are broken, and they are dangerous. And we're asking a young, wonderful, ambitious, amazing generation that needs us to work in these environments. Whether we like it or not, we have to take responsibility for the bad hand that you've been dealt. It is up to the companies to create an environment in which you can build your self-confidence. It is up to the companies to create an environment in which you can learn coping mechanisms and learn how to build strong, close relationships with people with whom you work, that you will eventually love and sacrifice to see that they gain. It is in these environments that we will learn the patience and the hard work that it takes to find fulfillment in our lives, to find a sense of purpose, a sense of joy. Yes, it's all fine and good that my generation and older generations say to you things like, well, you're the future leaders. We're the leaders now. We're the ones in control of the corporate environments now. And we're making your lives worse. I don't want you to jump from job to job to job to job. You will never find what you're looking for. It's not a scavenger hunt. I don't want you to go from relationship to relationship to relationship. What I want you to do is stand up and demand that the places in which you work lead you properly. Nobody wants to wake up in the morning and be managed. We want to wake up in the morning and be led. And we have a total leadership crisis in America. Politics is just the mirror reflection. We get the politicians we deserve. We're the divided ones. We're the selfish ones. We're the broken ones. We're the ones who would sooner sacrifice somebody else so that we may gain. It's us. And until we're willing to do the hard work of repairing the world around us, our country, our politics, our businesses will not fix. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. To learn the 10 sales techniques that can make you rich, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. If you can't influence, if you can't persuade, good luck trying to get your business off the ground. I'm not talking about just your customers. I'm talking about the bankers, the people, venture capitalists, your vendors, your credit card processor, the people who work for you.